Hello and welcome to the second in a series of diversity webinars hosted by the Arts Council. I'm David Lumgair, the Creative Director of Common, which is an organisation that I founded to improve socio-economic diversity in the arts. We support organisations to deconstruct barriers which prevent creatives and communities from working class backgrounds accessing their work. So I'm really pleased to be hosting this discussion today because I think it's so important that we open up this subject and the discussion more widely. So I'd like to let you know about the shape of our webinar this morning. Today I'm going to be joined by Director of Diversity at Arts Council England, Abid Hussein. Hello. Hi. Dr Susan Orman, a researcher from the University of Sheffield. Hello. And later on, we'll be joined by Kate Danielson, Director of Western Jerwood Creative Bursaries, Michelle McGrath, Founder of Museum as Muck, and Matthew Zia, Artistic Director of Actors Touring Company. We'll be discussing toolkits, practical solutions and research, and we'll also be hearing from you. We've been collating questions in the run-up to today's broadcast and if we don't manage to get to yours in the session today we will come back to you directly so please do keep sending them in via Twitter. So firstly Abid why this topic and why now? Thank you uh, we've been planning to do this work for a while it's an important piece of work for the Arts Council but also something which is quite important to me personally uh, so last year I wrote a blog to introduce the work that we were planning to do and it was very much written from that personal perspective of growing up in a working class community in Birmingham. Our definition of diversity at the Arts Council uh, includes socioeconomic background and class, but historically we've always captured data on protected characteristics under the Equality Act. So this is an opportunity for us to really address that imbalance and to get a bit more insight into the socioeconomic status and class background of people who work in the sector. Thanks for that, Abid. I think it's really valuable context for the discussion. And now we've got a short film from Kat Hammersley and the Arts Council's data team to share with you. Data is important to us at the Arts Council around diversity because uh, without the data we can't see who's actually accessing the work that we invest in um, and also who isn't, which is probably more important. We know that the arts sector is an incredibly diverse place and we want to be able to show that but most of our knowledge on that is anecdotal based on our own intelligence but we need the data to kind of back that up and then we can see where the gaps are and we can look to address any holes um, and doing that means that we can then see that everybody feels included um, and that the arts is an accessible place and it's for everyone. I hope that by making some changes to the annual survey, um, more than anything, we'll open up conversations. Um, I want to encourage the organisations to be having these conversations amongst themselves. Um, I think it's important for them to be talking to their staff about, about these issues. We know there's an appetite for it. We know that organisations are keen to start looking at this and to try and kind of tackle any gaps. Um, but it's not an easy conversation to have. So I think this is about kind of opening up a conversation, starting a two-way conversation. We want to hear back from this sector about the issues they're experiencing and also kind of what kind of organisational change it's brought about for them um, and that, you know, that they're making their, their own workforce feel that they can open up about who they are and where they're from. If any MPO is struggling with how to ask this question, um, I would say just be honest and open with your staff about why you're asking it. As long as you understand the reasons for why you're asking it and what you want to do with the information, you can make people feel reassured, reassured about answering it. Um, I think that's true of all kinds of diversity monitoring. If you're having any particular problems, like refer to the, the Jerwood kit, um, that would be a really useful resource. This webinar, show them that. Um, and also just talk to us. We want to have a two-way conversation. We don't want to just throw something at you and leave you to sort it out by yourselves. We're happy to help. We can recommend all kinds of different ways um, of monitoring to suit you and your organisation and your workforce. So talk to them, find out what works for them, find out what works for you as an organisation, um, and then come back to us and tell us how it went. So following on from that brief introduction and film from Kat, I'd like to bring in Dr Susan Ullman to talk a bit more about that research and what she found. So Susan, can you talk us through the starting point for you a little bit more? Well, I think, you know, we talk about making 
you know, getting a better picture of inequality and Abbott's made some really good points about what was missing from that picture. But the research was interested in the kinds of questions we need to ask to, to make that picture better. Because, you know, if tackling inequality is an issue of social justice, and I think we all kind of believe that it is, then we have to make sure that the way that we collect data is, is done with care. And what kind of process <coughs> did that involve? Well, we wanted it to be a very collaborative approach working with the arts and cultural sector and we wanted the work to be guided by Susan's methodology as a researcher. So it's, uh, it's a piece of work that we wanted to get right uh, and, and a big part of that was making sure arts organisations and museums could be involved in the conversations uh, but equally involving staff within the Arts Council because we want to capture data on our own workforce as well. And Susan, what would you add to that? Well, I suppose the thing is, is that asking people about their backgrounds and about their identity, was, which is essentially what we're talking about doing, is quite uncomfortable for people, both the people answering the questions and the people asking the questions. Mm -hmm. So what the research really tried to do was, you know, not only speak to the people who head up the diversity issues and have all the talk, or the people who collect the data and give it to the Arts Council and administer these equality monitoring data, but to speak to people in, in everyday contexts who have to answer these equality monitoring questions. I think we're kind of, we're quite used to answering them in certain contexts, but adding new questions in, it was quite important to understand how all of these things work together. Um, so the research had to understand all of these different things all at the same time almost. And the cultural sector's got its own specificities that the research needed to understand. You know, it's not representative of the national population and we know that. But also, you know, when, when people talk about research about the cultural sector, they tend to talk about people who have obviously artsy jobs. So the people who work behind the scenes, the people in finance or the people who work in box office or, you know, the security guards and, you know, the painters and decorators all get forgotten from painting this picture of the sector. Um, also, lots of people have, you know, five jobs. We don't have one job in the creative sector at any one time, do we? Or indeed, we have lots of periods where we're not employed at all. So looking at the workforce as a thing is complicated in, in and of itself. Then there's this, this history from the social sciences and from government of using specific ways to measure socioeconomic background. Um, and even though the arts haven't necessarily been using them, these measures exist, there are longitudinal data sets and you know, we need to collect robust data that kind of speaks to that. So that's why what the research tried to do was trial these established questions that have been around for half a century, some of them, <laughs> together with things that were tried to be more nimble and more appropriate to the cultural sector to see how people felt about the questions themselves, like how did they feel answering these questions. And actually as a result of that we opened up a, a wider conversation about what class is and what it means and how we should be talking about it. And I know from my own experience that those conversations can be quite challenging to say the least. Um, so what approach did you end up taking on the basis of starting to ask those questions? Uh, I suppose the only thing you can do really is give people space to talk honestly about their own experiences and I think that like the previous work on the sector that's talked about how the sector is struggling with the class issue or struggling to talk about it has tended to kind of assume that everyone doesn't want to talk about class because they're quite privileged. Whereas actually what came out from my research from like you know speaking to hundreds of people in the sector was actually people Lots of people who work in the sector, who work in MPOs, have lost the language to talk about class. They felt that talking about someone's class made them judgmental and they kind of had to get over that. Um, so that was kind of one of the key findings. Another thing that came out of the research was, of course, actually that people didn't necessarily understand what these questions meant. So asking someone, you know, what was your parents' job when you were 14 out of the blue can feel quite jarring. Um, it can feel quite alien. And so what um, what the research intended to do was kind of pull this apart a little bit, understand what, what was uncomfortable about these questions, what was uncomfortable about the class conversation, and kind of open it up a little more. That's great, some really useful <coughs> insight. And so, so Abid, now that Susan's completed and published the findings of that research, what are the next steps with this conversation? It's, it's been brilliant to kind of have Susan talk us through the process that we've been through. So for me, it's now moving from that research phase into data capture. So from April next year, we're going to be asking our national portfolio organisations to provide data for the first time on socioeconomic background. 
for their workforce and their leadership. And then what we'll do with that data is once we've had an opportunity to analyze it, we'll publish it as part of our next equality diversity and the creative case report, which will be published in early 2021. That's great news. And I think an evidence base is a really good start and definitely feels like a step in the right direction. So we'd like to turn our thoughts to what organisations can be doing around recruitment right here, right now. Before we speak to Kate from Joe Wood Arts, we're going to show you a short film from them on the work that they do. If you don't see people like you involved in the arts, you will automatically think that the arts isn't for you. Since 2010, the Western German Creative Bursaries Programme has worked with 110 of the UK's leading arts organisations from across the UK and across art forms to kickstart the careers of 124 people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. About 14% um, of artists are from a working class origin. The programme supports people at the start of their careers to get in and to get on. Being in the East Midlands, it's been difficult to find opportunities that apply to what I want to do, which is directing. After uni, I did what everyone does and panics. And I kind of quickly realised that it wasn't as straightforward as I kind of previously envisioned. I think going through university, you know, I had to sort of act a bit middle class. My Birmingham accent isn't very strong these days. All these things to sort of fit in. I was doing a job that I definitely didn't think that I could do and I was terrified that someone was going to point me out and go, she's not supposed to be here, who, who let her in? I am surprised at the lack of working class voices uh, in the arts. I remember at the beginning in the application process, some people said they would never have applied for a role like this if it hadn't been specifically targeted at them and their background. How you frame an opportunity makes a huge difference. You always think of that one person that gave you that your head start and like give you your chance and for me that was sort of Western Jerby. Being part of a cohort was uh, was amazing. It's the best opportunity that there is. It's important that institutions themselves uh, take responsibility to change and to be more open uh, and more diverse, both in class terms but actually in terms of things like ethnicity, gender and disability. And looking back at how I've got from, you know, being this kid in Kidderminster, working behind the customer service desk in TK Maxx, uh, to being the first person to do a degree in my family, to fast forward eight years and actually now being artistic director of Fierce Festival, it's really all down to having that uh, Western uh, Jaywood creative bursary at the Live Art Development Agency. It's really uh, transformed everything. Thanks for joining us today, Kate, and for sharing that film. Can you tell us a little bit about the toolkit that you've developed? Mm, thank you. Yes, I have a copy here. It's called, snappy title, Socioeconomic Diversity and Inclusion in the Arts, um, a toolkit for employers. Um, the toolkit provides very practical guidance for all arts and cultural organisations um, who are looking at the socioeconomic diversity of their organisation, the workforce, the artists they work with. Um, the toolkit provides um, some rationale about why we should be um, focusing on socioeconomic background. Um, there is a very detailed action plan about how to implement some of these changes and uh, a range of case studies, um, the, the questions you need to ask, where you can um, um, advertise, uh, lots of guidance to get people started for organisations at whatever stage they're at in their change, whether they're just beginning to think about this or whether they're quite advanced. Um, and uh, hopefully the idea is that anybody can pick this up and find something of value for them. And can you tell us a bit about Joe Wood Art's journey to this point? and what's provoked you to be thinking about this subject in the first place? Uh, yes, um, as a funder, 
a Jerwood Arts are really um, committed to the idea that it's important for everybody from all walks of life to have access to working in the arts and to make the art that we all see. Um, and uh, we set up the Western Jerwood Creative Bursaries in 2010 uh, to look at the barriers faced by those from um, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, those who don't have access to um, financial support to work for free, who don't have existing networks to get in. And um, uh, so we focused on the leaders of the future. How could we turbocharge their CVs so that they might be future leaders? Um, and that we, we recognize in doing this that it isn't all down to the individual fellows. It's also about arts organizations and how they recruit in a different way. And what encouraged Jerwood Arts to create this toolkit now? So the toolkit follows on from almost a decade of running the programme. We've worked with 110 arts organisations, 125 fellows have been involved. And um, what we found in our evaluation was that there was an implicit expectation that the fellows would create change from within, within the organisations. And research showed that whilst we have had some great success stories, I mean, we heard from Aaron there, who's the um, artistic director of Fierce Festival, there have been some great success stories individually, but there's been very little change in the sector and certainly in the, um, in the leadership. And so our focus now is very much on organisations and how they can create change from within. Um, and uh, we worked with the Bridge Group on the toolkit, who are um, a leading uh, not-for-profit cons consultancy, working using research to improve social equality. And they've brought in the, the um, research from other sectors and advice from other sectors about how to do this in a very strategic way. Um, and we hope that the toolkit will actively support organisations to do, to make a start or to make the next step and it feels like there's a real appetite now um, I've been talking at a number of conferences recently and uh, and and the questions the, the the appetite from people to understand more and to start doing something about it it feels really that we're at the right moment now so as you said I think the toolkit's a good starting point for organizations but I'm interested to ask what you think the practical steps that organisations should be taking to make meaningful change actually are? Yeah, well, we've, we've got in the toolkit our five top tips so that if people read nothing else, we hope they will at least read the, these. So number one is to measure the socioeconomic background of your workforce and the artists you work with. And our recommendation is the one key question to ask is parental occupation when you were 14. This is the one that all the other sectors, the other sectors use, that the cabinet office use, and uh, it will allow us then to measure within our sector and without. The second one is to start having conversations about talent, about merit, about taste, because these language really matters and uh, we need to educate ourselves more about what these mean and what they mean to people from different backgrounds. Uh, the third one is, it's a really big topic, create more inclusive cultures. But in the past there's always been a focus on when new people join the organisation and particularly people from different backgrounds is to help them to assimilate as quickly as possible into the existing culture. But what we need to do more is to accommodate people from other backgrounds so that they instantly feel comfortable or can enable them to, to feel comfortable as quickly as possible. And where we start adapting to their um, values uh, more. A fourth one is ceasing unpaid and unadvertised opportunities of any sort because everybody you let in through the back door is disadvantaging somebody without those networks. And the fifth one is the most powerful change that people can make within organisations is to change the way you recruit, change your practices. Have a look at the way you write job descriptions and the person specs because if you are using the language that people don't understand, they will never even come to you in the first place.
I think those are some fantastic actions for organisations to start embedding, especially beginning to measure socioeconomic background and just stopping unpaid or unadvertised jobs and internships. Could I also ask, do you have any practical recommendations of what organisations should really be focusing these conversations about talent and merit on so that essentially they don't just end up with the same answer that they've had in the past. Yes, yes. Well, I think, I do think it begins with job descriptions and person spec because um, every, every organization will put in things like, you know, um, where we welcome applications from people from all backgrounds, and then they write a job description, which is clearly only geared to people that are familiar with the sector, like front of house and it, all these terms, which mean nothing if you don't have existing experience and and then we talk about passion you must have a passion well what does it mean what does a passion mean is a passion something that you gain from having been taken to the theater by your parents all through your childhood and doing an amazing internship in new york or is it about somebody who's found arts for themselves without any um parental or, or family support so i think um we need to ask more questions, invite um, other ideas about how you might talk about uh, jobs in a way that is applicable to people that have come from completely, um, completely different sectors. And then I think that gets people thinking more about their internal cultures, is, is who do you have at the meetings, who makes decisions. But, but unless you are including them in the conversations, nothing will ever change internally. And so following the toolkit, what are Joe Wood Art's next steps? Ah, yes. So we, um, earlier this month, we've launched the fourth edition of Western Joe Wood Creative Bursaries. We are currently open for applications from organisations, all arts, cultural organisations across the sector, to apply to create a year-long fellowship, which is attached to their artistic leadership, or cultural leadership, and also to take part in an 18-month organisational change programme. Um, go to the Joe Arts website and it's open until the end of January. Fantastic. Thanks, Kate. I think all of what you've said is really useful advice for the audience to be thinking about, and definitely one for organisations to be looking at with that opportunity. So as brilliant as research, measurement and practical toolkits are towards tackling this issue, I'm keen that we put these into context around the voices and the lived experiences of those who are actually experiencing the inequality to understand why it's so important that organisations take this need for structural change so seriously. Now we're going to be joined by Michelle McGrath and Matthew Zia. We've heard a lot from an organisational point of view, so I think it's a good time to talk about it from a personal experience perspective as well. So I started Common because of a really challenging string of personal circumstances and really significant barriers that I was facing in my own career as a working class director, which meant I was on a real knife edge about whether I could keep working in the sector. And then I realised that there were so many creatives from similar backgrounds to my own with their own version of that story in the industry, but that nobody had offered them a platform to share those experiences, let alone any meaningful support being offered to support their career development. So on the back of that, I'm really interested to know about how you both got into the sector. Michelle, could we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, so coming from a benefits class background rather than um, you know, working class, there were no working people around me. Um, I didn't have any work role models. Um, I found myself going into teaching, I think because it's you know an obvious profession. If you look around, you don't have that um, in your immediate family, but you see these public roles. Um, and then when I was in teaching, I really found an affinity with, you know, creative ways of learning. And then um, through that, you know, explored museums and galleries as spaces to do that. Um, and then essentially 12 years ago, I just kind of started volunteering as a lot of people have to do and just worked my way up um, to, you know, now head of education and learning at an arts organisation. Right, and, and Matthew, does that strike a chord with your experience? I guess so, in that, that I kind of came, I was, I was born into poverty. Um, 
and within that, and I guess come up some of the kind of circumstances around that meant that I, I was uh, a bit of a naughty kid. Maybe that's how we should put it. <laughs> uh, but luckily I found Theatre Royal Stratford East. That was my local theatre uh, with this huge legacy of kind of empowering working class communities. You know, Joan Littlewood revolutionised British theatre. Um, and so that was the space I was walking into. And I felt incredibly lucky, actually, to walk into a space that empowered me, gave me a voice, a platform, told me I was an artist. Um, and I think without, you know, without a formal education, actually, what Stratford East offered me was a form of education, uh, it, it, a craft, a sense of what it meant to exist within a sector. As a bit of an incubator, and by the time I left Stratford East, after you know, I joined the youth there when I was 11 and left at 28, having done lots of different jobs within there, um, I guess I was on my way to, to artistic leadership by that point. Um, but I'd say it was people actually uh, within those organisations who empowered me and gave me a voice. So Philip Headley, the artistic director, Danny Braverman, head of the education department, um, who invested belief, I guess. I think from what you've said about Stratford East, it might sound bold, but it feels incredibly rare to actually encounter an arts organisation that has such a strong relationship with its community, like you said. And so because that experience is so rare, I'd be interested to ask both of you what the barriers that you encountered either at first point of access or later in your journey whilst you were working in the sector. Um, so barriers, I mean, there's, there's uh, numerous ones. And I, I think that when we think about class, often people really focus on financial barriers, which we must do, you know, it's, it's, it's key. But also um, a lot of the time, unless you have that lived experience, you, people or organisations don't necessarily consider um, the, the, the social and cultural barriers that, that we can experience. So, you know, not having um, those networks or connections into the arts sector, um, and, you know, for people like me um, who didn't have anyone around them that, that, that um, were professionals or worked in jobs. So no knowledge, no knowledge of, you know, what it means to write a CV or go for an interview, or what a recruitment process looks like. Um, no knowledge of what it means to be in a work environment. Um, and then once you're in there, it's un those unwritten middle class codes and, and having to learn those. So as well as, you know, kind of getting into the museum sector and learning what that was about, I also had to learn what it, what it was to be a middle class person and kind of, you know, assimilate um, and then deal with things like, you know, people assuming that you are, you have shared experiences um, and same background as them um, and, and suffering from imposter syndrome a lot of people in my network relate to this and, and feeling like you're you know you're, you don't belong you're not meant to be there and Matthew is that the same for you yeah for me I guess it was quite practical uh coming from a poor household having no formal education past GCSE uh and although like like uh, Michelle says it is kind of mainly a financial barrier uh that presents lots more barriers uh kind of which are cultural and internalized in a way. Um, I think the buildings also and the institutions are imposing, you know, they are physically imposing and they kind of say, you don't belong here quite a lot of the time. This, this isn't a space for you. Um, and then again, I guess it's that lack of awareness around what the pathway is. How do you forge a career in the arts if, if you know, the two people in your house, one is, one is on benefits and the other one is a kind of carpenter and joiner working for the local council. Um, I guess, I guess they're the struggles that, that people come up against. I think also there were probably kind of, for me, perceptions around my class and ethnicity, so a kind of intersectionality that became a, a barrier. So I think that point that you've just made is really important about intersectionality, the relationship between your class and your ethnicity. Can you just unpick that a little bit more? Yeah, I guess for me they're kind of um, expectations around the sorts of stories I would want to tell or could tell or felt empowered to tell. Uh, so there was kind of a limitation on my creative field of vision, I guess. Um, also within that, I guess, and this is a kind of perception of self, which is delivered from existing in this society. Um, again, I didn't belong in those spaces and those spaces didn't want me in them. So I had to break that down internally. Um, I didn't speak the right language. I didn't dress right. So the first thing for me was, like you said, to try and assimilate uh, and to change the way I spoke and to change the way I dressed and change my manner. And this is like a working class hip hop kid from the East End of London who normally wore hoodies and baggy jeans uh, and Adidas trainers and suddenly felt like that wasn't permissible, I guess. Um, 
I think also still now I'm, I'm still invited to make shows about my ethnicity as if the only thematic I'm interested in is, is my own identity or my own lived experience, which feels really reductive. I think that and everything that you've both shared are really crucial and actually very under-discussed and under-investigated issues, um, which I know that we've all been working to try and change in our own respective ways. Um, I'd like to ask you both one last question, starting with you, Michelle, which is what would your recommendations be for organisations around what meaningful changes they can make to support future creatives from our backgrounds? Um, I think it's really important actually that you're putting the focus there on the organisations as well because yeah, we're all, we all work hard to kind of make class visible um, but often the, the onus is put on working class people to, to do that job. Um, so yeah, making class visible, um, highlighting those hidden inequalities that we've spoken about that are not just focused on financial, you know, it doesn't just take giving people a bursary to, to um, uh, you know, give them that entitlement of being successful in the arts. Um, it's, it's easy for institutions to be able to, to hide from class because it can be invisible and it's really difficult to measure. Um, and, you know, it is about institutional change and not just assimilation of working class people. Um, so sharing your privilege, um, educate yourself on class issues, don't assume others have the same lived experiences that you do. And if you're in a position of power, especially a position of leadership, then use that power to platform class issues. And Matthew, what are your provocations for, for change? Yeah, I think there are some kind of quick wins, which are to start to use positive action to change the culture of your organisation. Uh, apply targets if you're not quite willing to apply quotas, which are a bit more fixed than the target, I guess. You can be off target slightly if you want. Um, I think we need a shift in the language and culture of institutions around the idea of diversity. What is it we're really looking for? And I think that's actually a kind of diversity of lived experience, uh, cognitive diversity or diversity of thought, which, which I think tends to come from being born into a different set of circumstances and living that life with those protected characteristics. We can decodify the language. I think uh, Kate was talking about that earlier on. So stop using language that alienates, that, that people have to kind of look up in a dictionary to understand what a patron is uh, when you think you're just a ticket buyer uh, or an audience member. Um, and I think the big thing for me is that organisations need to stop seeing difference as risk, ultimately. So thank you so much to both of you. And there are some really brilliant provocations there which strike a chord with what Kate and others have said during the webinar as well. Now, I'm gonna ask the rest of the panel to rejoin us and it's time for some questions from you, our audience. So the first question that I'd like to put to all of you is from Lucy at Norwich Art Centre, which is what can be done to support women from working class backgrounds to attain those senior positions when there are so few role models? Would anyone like to kick us off? Well, I suppose the thing is, is that maybe there are more women in senior positions than we think there are. And certainly when I was speaking to all the MPOs last year, that's what I encountered. It's not necessarily the lead or the lead of an organisation, but certainly on the board or directing the future of an organisation. But maybe, maybe those people aren't talking about their origins or their backgrounds in a way that we need them to. Yeah, this is for me this is that process of um, assimilation again, so that by the time someone comes out of that, it's quite hard to tell where they started, who they were before they entered the arts sector. Um, and I, immediately I'm thinking of m lots of female leaders that, I can, that are coming to mind who I think are all working class, uh, but they've learned to talk the speech of arts, uh, which suddenly just kind of nullifies any sort of individuality, I guess. Yeah, so I've, um I don't, I don't know if I'm quite at that leadership position yet, but um, you know I've, I've properly outed myself as working class now. So hopefully, you know, um, people doing that, removing shame, not being ashamed of, of your origins, um, hopefully provides a role model for other people. Um, but also specifically thinking about women, um, organisations need to um, tailor to their to their needs. So you know. Um, more women have childcare responsibilities, how are they going to adapt to that? Um, you know, what, what, what is your flexible working policy? Um, and really asking women what they need in order to, to be able to have them, you know, start a career or be in an institution, have, have work in the arts sector. Mm. 
I think it comes back to what we were talking before about conversations. You know, all of this is conversations. It's conversations where people feel they can talk about the barriers that they faced and the way both of you have talked about it. And then also conversations about what people need in order to do their job properly. Um, and uh, so um, I think the answer is very much about having conversations and more of them. <laughs> So the next question I have, and this might be particularly appropriate for you, Abid, is from Stephanie Gascoigne at RJC Dance, which is how important is the creative case for diversity in the context of cultural democracy, especially as we're asking questions as to whether or not public money that banned three arts organisations receive is actually directly benefiting or engaging people from challenging socioeconomic backgrounds? I think cultural democracy is at the heart of the creative case. So when we talk about the creative case for diversity, we're talking about giving voices to communities who have not seen themselves represented on our stages, in our galleries, and our museums. And certainly from my perspective as a policymaker, if you're one of our larger institutions that receives more public funding, it's critical that you provide opportunities for everyone's stories to be told. And I guess one example I tend to give to people is from a theatre perspective. So I have three daughters, their names are Mariam, Aisha and Anissa. And the challenge I will always put to a theatre maker is when was the last time that my daughters went to the theatre and saw a character on stage that had the names Mariam, Aisha or Anissa? So if they don't see themselves reflected on stage, they're invisible. And my job as a policymaker to say to my kids, hey, this is a career for you, how do I do that? Mm. I think it's really important also that we remember where this, this public subsidy comes from. Uh, so as far as I understand, the majority of it comes from the National Lottery. So it's a bit of a kind of backdoor taxation on some of the poorest members of society and some of the most desperate members of society. That money is then given by the Arts Council to these organisations who further exclude those same lottery buying uh, members of public from the institutions that, that is funded with their own cash. As an Arts Council, we're distributing both funding from the National Lottery and government granting aid. And I think it's absolutely essential for us to make sure that funding reflects the communities that we're there to serve. And from my perspective, from the conversations we've been having with the sector and the general public through the consultation process we've been doing with the 10-year strategy, uh, one of the drivers for our work around equality and diversity moving forward will be about ensuring the organisations that receive funding from the Arts Council ensure that they're more relevant to the communities that they're serving. And the next question that I have is from Dr Simon Dancy, the Chief Executive Officer at Creative and Cultural Skills and their question is how complicit are arts institutions and charities in maintaining power inequalities by actually reinforcing some of the worst aspects of inequality but not implementing structural change? I don't think I believe lots of arts organisations or arts organisations really do want structural change because what that would require is for people to step away from the positions that they've been holding for, for a number of years. Um, I think that's the big difference. I think people want to give the appearance of kind of progression and uh, diversity. Yeah, and well, thinking about museums specifically, I mean, they have, you know, a civic duty, surely, to represent all of society. Um, that should be their, their role. Um, and we were talking earlier about, you know, as the arts sector, we're, we're the innovators. We're so behind. Like we should, we should really. We're, we're the creative people. We should be out there, um, really leading the way in in change and progression. Well, I also think I've been having a lot of conversations recently about the performativity or the performance of diversity. That institutions always seem to be in the process of becoming more diverse, rather than actually simply being diverse and being mm. representative. So I think a lot of the, certainly in my experience with the conversations I've had through Common, my experience is that the, the argument that a lot of these organisations present is that, oh, well, we're in the process of, or oh, we are still becoming, or oh, we are continuing to deepen our conversations about, which to me feel very jargonised and actually end up uh, recycling that inequality and just mm. repackaging it and representing it in a different but ultimately identical way. 
And I think that one of one of the issues of performing diversity like that is what you see is perhaps the opening up of entry level positions for people from different backgrounds or different ethnicities performing diversity, but essentially that it's not it's not feeding up and the idea that eventually in 20 years time we might be more diverse as a sector well that's quite a long wait and certainly isn't very progressive is it so we're not supported by british employment law to make any of the actual changes we want to make because if you've been in a job for longer than your probation period it's kind of a job forever if you want to keep it that way and you can make it incredibly difficult for an organi organization to get you out of that institution um, unless they're doing restructuring uh, and this is a conversation i'm trying to have with a number of people to uh, to kind of go, is, is law fit for what the government and the Arts Council are asking the organisations to do? Because it, it feels like there's a bit of a kind of a clash at the moment. So our next question is from Nicola Frost at Arts Council. And Nicola says that although problematic in their own way, I found volunteering opportunities at museums to be a lifeline for trying to get into the sector. But even then, there was undoubtedly a difference in volunteering opportunities for those in the know, tending to be curatorial and conservation posts, and those starting out with no foundation in the sector, which were usually visitor experience posts. So Nicola's question is, what can we do to truly open up entrance points into the museums or wider arts and cultural sector? Um, well, I think that in terms of volunteering opportunities, um, or in, in fact job opportunities, it's um, absolute, having like an absolute blanket ban on non-advertised opportunities. Um, everything needs to go outside of the institution. Um, also specifically, you know, in that language, who you're targeting, put that in, in that, that job description. Say to people, we are looking for working class people. Um, if I had seen that, you know, 12 years ago when I was volunteer, I, like it, it would have made such a difference. Um, and I know that there are other people who, who will, you know, it will give them that kind of confidence that actually, oh, they're, they're looking for me. Um, and then again, I think we need to remember that once we get people, you know, once we give people social mobility into um, organizations, we need to continue to support them. Um, so once, you know, somebody is volunteering, then make sure that you are asking them exactly what support they need. Are you matching them up with other working class people or working class allies in that organisation so they know they've got um, a network and a community around them? Um, and if we're thinking about museums specifically, obviously join the museum as mug network. Mm. <laughs> Can I say as well, um, so in this um, fourth edition of Western Germany Creative Bursaries, we are partnering with the Art Fund for the first time to include museums, which we haven't in the past, for particularly this reason that the Art Fund identified that there is a specific issue with a lack of socioeconomic diversity in, in museums and lack of access into entry um, level roles. So we are specifically encouraging arts organisations and cultural organisations to apply for um, uh, emerging curator type posts in the next edition of the programme. I think there's also something to be said about where posts are advertised. I think the sector's got really used to advertising posts in sector specific press rather than we want someone from the local community. They're never going to read some kind of symphony orchestra obscure magazine, mm. uh, probably can't afford to buy it even. So thinking about how we advertise posts to a local community if the organisation is supposed to be serving that community mm. is one of the things that organisations really need to think about. In the yeah. And that's in the, our toolkit as well. <laughs> it just there's a lot about uh, you know different places to advertise and posters in local community centers and yeah don't don't just think but I'll put it on arts jobs and and that's my advertising done that's just going to get you the same people you've always had I'm pretty sure there was mention earlier of just banning voluntary positions from the get-go banning intern positions that are, are underpaid or unpaid because that immediately creates a two-tier system of those who can afford to do voluntary positions and those who can't so I, I would create that I'd take your blanket and turn it into a blanket ban on on unpaid positions. However, I think there's some very useful guidance um, by Arts Council and CC Skills about the difference between volunteering and and internships. I mean, I think there is a role for people um, volunteering their time 
for them to get the experience that they need, not to, to deliver a role that should be paid, but for them to get some valuable experience where it's, it's about what they can get out of it, not about what the organisation can get out of them delivering their, offering their time. But, it, it but feels you have that to time costs money, and, and when you're yeah. working class and you come from a working class background, that is your one resource you have. Yeah. yeah. It also feels like there's a gesture that you're making, Matthew, about if there is a relationship between somebody that is in a voluntary position, which then happens to lead into mm -hmm. some form of paid opportunity that is non-advertised and, and isn't shared publicly, there's obviously a direct relationship bes between somebody's situation and environment allowing them to fulfill a voluntary position which then potentially also leads on to further paid opportunities mm. which working class people wouldn't have the opportunity to access mm. yeah so thanks to those of you who sent us questions and before we wrap up i'd just like to come back to you quickly abid for some final reflections on today what have we learned well, it's wonderful to be at the point now where the incredible research that Susan's done has got us to a place where we can ask a question that allows us to really report and capture data on socioeconomic background and status. I think the work that Jerwood Arts have done with their toolkit will be incredibly helpful to the sector in terms of navigating how they capture and collect that data for the Arts Council, which we can then uh, begin to publish uh, later in 2021. And, and I guess the final reflection for me has been about the importance of having working class voices across the arts and cultural sector. And today, I think it's really important to acknowledge the work of those individuals, but also organisations like Museum, ASMUC, Common and Actors Touring Company in, in the efforts that they've taken to really bring this to the forefront of the debate and I hope we can continue to work with organisations like that and others uh, to create the opportunities that many people haven't had previously. Fantastic. So we've now come to the end of our webinar and before we go I'd just like to say thank you to you all for taking part and finally from all of us here at Leeds Playhouse thank you for watching and goodbye. <laughs>